The media has called this case the next George Floyd. But what is the law and what are the facts surrounding this case? Here's the case of Jordan Neal. On May 1st, 2023, at about 2.15 in the afternoon, a 30-year-old man named Jordan Neely entered the northbound F train at the 2nd Avenue subway station. Now, witnesses claim Mr. Neely became aggressive and threatening, placing them in fear of their safety. This is Juan Alberto Velez. He's the man who recorded the infamous video that everyone's seen. Now, here is his eyewitness account of what happened on the train that day. According to a witness, the man began shouting, quote, I want food. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm ready to go back to jail, and I'll hurt anyone on this train. The man got on the subway car and began to say a somewhat aggressive speech, saying that he was hungry, he was thirsty, and he didn't care about anything. He didn't care about going to jail, that he didn't care that he gets a big life sentence, and it doesn't matter if he died. Vasquez says he was scared and believes others on the train were too. If there was fear... The people who were bluish, or who were there, where he separated everything, moved from their place. I stayed sitting in my place, because it was a little further away. But obviously, those moments, well, one thing's fear, one thing's he may be armed. So after Mr. Neely continued to threaten passengers, claiming, I'll hurt anyone on this train, so three men attempted to restrain this violent man. The men can be seen on video holding Mr. Neely, attempting to keep him under control until police can arrive. Daniel Penny, a former Marine, went behind Mr. Neely and placed him in a rear naked chokehold while the two other passengers assisted in restraining him. Now, passengers called 911 for help at about 2.25 p.m. as they attempted to restrain Mr. Neely. The train had only traveled one stop from 2nd Avenue to Broadway Lafayette. Now, Mr. Neely at the time of this incident had an active warrant for his arrest. See, on November 12, 2021, Mr. Neely, age 22 at the time, punched a 67-year-old woman in the face and broke her nose and fractured her orbital bone. This actually happened in the subway. Way. The woman suffered serious bruising and swelling, and Mr. Neely pleaded guilty to second-degree assault. A warrant was issued for his arrest on February 23, 2023. Now, after the train made it to the next station, the doors opened. Mr. Neely was still in the chokehold when another passenger could be heard on the video warning Daniel Penny to be careful. Quote, you don't want to catch a murder charge. You got a hell of a chokehold on, man. End quote. The men restraining Mr. Neely released their holds immediately and placed Mr. Neely on his side in what's known as the recovery position. At 2.46 p.m., EMS arrived. Mr. Neely was pronounced dead at the hospital. Now, the eyewitnesses at the scene were interviewed, and they all claimed that Mr. Neely was being violent, harassing, and threatening their safety. Even the man who recorded the incident on video, Juan Alberto Vasquez, reported he was scared and believes others on the train were scared as well. Vasquez says he was scared and believes others on the train were too. Now, before the incident became racially charged, here is how local news reported it. Well, police are investigating after they say some subway rider in Manhattan put a harassing passenger in a headlock and that passenger later died. Authorities say 30-year-old was acting erratically and threatening other passengers yesterday on an F train at the Broadway Lafayette station when the 24-year-old stepped in to try to subdue the man. The man who died has 44 prior arrests in the subway system, including violent crimes. Police questioned the 24-year-old but released him and no charges have been filed. Now, two days Days later, on May 3rd, the medical examiner for New York City declared Jordan Neely's death a homicide. Now, a homicide is defined as the killing of one human being by another. Homicide is a general term and may refer to non-criminal acts as well as the criminal act of murder. So just because the medical examiner labeled something as a homicide doesn't mean a crime has been committed. Now, Mr. Penny has lawyered up and his lawyer has released a statement. It says, when Mr. Neely began aggressively threatening Daniel Penny and the other passengers, Daniel, with the help of others, acted to protect themselves until help arrived. Far too long, those suffering from mental illness have been treated with indifference. We hope that out of this awful tragedy will come a new commitment by elected officials to address the mental health crisis on our streets and subways. The statement goes on to say that Mr. Penny never intended to harm the 30-year-old homeless man and could not have foreseen his untimely death. Now, 
let's turn to my analysis. So let's just go over the facts as we know them. We have a man, Mr. Neely, with an active violent warrant headed into a subway train. That man starts acting violent to the passengers, harassing the passengers, and threatening their personal safety. Eyewitnesses on the train reported being in fear of Mr. Neely. Multiple passengers attempted to restrain Mr. Neely, who was acting violently, threatening other passengers, and called police for assistance. The man, Mr. Neely, died while being restrained. And the last fact that I think is going to be important to our analysis is that no one on the train believed that Mr. Neely's life was at risk. Here's what one of the eyewitnesses in the train at the time said. I think no one thought that he was in a risky situation because he was defending himself all the time. All the time he moved, he tried to remove his arm, and then when they had it on his side, he kept kicking. So we thought that he's defending himself. Now, from these facts, Mr. Neely was committing multiple crimes, including assault and harassment. And that's because he was placing the passengers on the train in fear of imminent bodily harm. Now, the three passengers who attempted to restrain Mr. Neely in calling the police are the ones we're going to be focused on in this analysis. And the simple question is, are these three men guilty of a crime? Now, I understand the race hustlers all focused on Mr. Penny because he's white. And it's such a better story if you say white man kills black homeless man for no reason. That's what they're trying to portray. But Mr. Penny is not the only one who has any legal liability here. This essentially, if you're going to charge Mr. Penny with a crime, you also have to charge the other two men who assisted Mr. Penny in trying to restrain Mr. Neely. The other passengers that held Mr. Neely's arms and legs while Mr. Penny applied the chokehold would also be liable for criminal charges, including an involuntary manslaughter charge, because they were aiding and embedding the restraint of Mr. Neely, which led to his death. And as you can see from the video, there are two other men here actively restraining Mr. Neely. And the reason why you haven't heard their names is because they aren't white. So our analysis will have to encompass all three of these individuals as they were all involved in the death of Mr. Neely. So the first thing you're going to hear about is murder. Did these men murder Mr. Neely? Now, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says that these men committed murder. New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeting, Jordan Neely was murdered. Again, that is her opinion, not an official charge. But because Jordan was houseless and crying for food in a time when the city is raising rents and stripping services to militarize itself, while many in power demonize the poor, the murderer gets protected with passive headlines and no charges. It's disgusting. So did these men commit murder? Well, in New York, for murder, you need intent. Intent to either one, cause the death of another person, or two, intent to cause another person serious physical injury. Now, it doesn't seem like Mr. Penny intended to do either of these things. And it's unlikely that he would be charged with the crime of murder because there's no evidence to show that he intended to cause the death of Mr. Neely or to even cause him serious bodily harm. Now, what's more likely is going to be a manslaughter charge. Now, manslaughter is the unintentional killing of another that's done in a reckless manner and without justification. In New York, the state's going to have to prove that these three men, including Mr. Penny, knew what they were doing could cause death and disregarded that risk and did it anyway. A classic example is someone playfully pointing a a gun at someone and the gun accidentally discharged. This would be known as involuntary manslaughter. Now you can see the argument from both sides. Placing someone in a chokehold for a long period of time may qualify for involuntary manslaughter because they would say, well, you should have known doing so could cause death and you may have disregarded that risk. But remember the witnesses at the scene claim that there was no perceived risk. Here's what the man who actually shot the video said in his statement. I think no one thought that he was in a risky situation because he was defending himself all the time. All the time he moved, he tried to remove his arm, and then when they had it on his side, he kept kicking. So we thought that he's defending himself. Now, this witness's testimony is fatal to an involuntary manslaughter charge. And the reason why is simple. If one of the elements for involuntary manslaughter is first knowing that there's a risk of death and then disregarding that risk, well, all the witnesses are claiming that no one knew or perceived that there was any risk to the life of Mr. Neely. So if no one was aware of the risk, and that's one of the requirements for involuntary manslaughter, then it's going to be very difficult for the prosecution to prove its case. 
Now, one of the charges that the district attorney's office can also hit, which I think is probably their most successful charge, would just be a simple assault charge, which means essentially recklessly causing physical injury to another person in an unlawful way. So that's simply what you could charge in this case. But again, all three men would be susceptible to this charge because they were all aiding and abetting in this assault. Now, last but not least, we also have to speak about self-defense or justification as it's known in New York. Now, in New York, you have the legal right to defend yourself or others from criminal activity as long as it's reasonable. Now, was there a reasonable fear in the situation? Well, from the reports of the men and women on the train, yes, they were all in fear of their personal safety. They were moving away from Mr. Neely, trying to avoid him at all costs, and even the man who took the video confirmed that he and others were in fear for their safety. But that brings us to the next factor we need to evaluate under New York self-defense law. Was all of this reasonable? Was the response from the passengers who tried to detain Mr. Neely reasonable? And was the amount of force they used to detain Mr. Neely reasonable. This is what the jury is going to have to decide. Essentially, the law is going to be asking, did these passengers overreact in attempting to detain Mr. Neely? Now, don't jump to conclusions because just because Mr. Neely died from his injuries doesn't automatically mean the amount of force used was not reasonable. Now, remember, you have to evaluate this from the evidence that's induced at the scene. What did the other passengers think about what was going on? Did they feel that the amount of force that was being used to detain Mr. Neely was unreasonable? Remember, it's those witnesses who are going to testify. What was the level of fear? What was the level of dread within that subway car? Were the three men who were trying to restrain Mr. Neely, were they acting reasonably in their attempts to stop his violent acts? Now, unless the prosecutor can keep it out, the juror will likely hear of Mr. Neely's 42 arrests, including his violent assault against the 67-year-old woman on the subway. Now, this may go to Mr. Neely's mental state at the time. So, did these three passengers involved in restraining Mr. Neely commit a crime in New York? Well, remember, these three men are going to argue that they were acting in defense of themselves and they were acting in the defense of others. Now, these men are going to point to Mr. Neely's violent threats against other passengers that placed them in fear of imminent bodily harm. Well, in defense of Mr. Neely, some people are making the argument that Mr. Neely hadn't attacked anyone yet, so he didn't need to be restrained until he started attacking people. But that is nonsense because the law doesn't say that you have to be attacked or injured before you can apply self-defense. A serious enough threat of harm or danger is enough that allows an individual to defend themselves, right, from being injured. So this nonsense that Mr. Neely hadn't injured anybody, so he should have been allowed to continue to threaten people is essentially nonsense. The law recognizes that threats alone could be enough to trigger someone to defend themselves against those threats. So here are my thoughts. This is what I like to call lawful but awful. You have a serial criminal with 42 arrests and an active warrant with mental health issues who starts violently threatening passengers on an uptown F train. Witnesses reported being in fear of their personal safety and passengers tried to detain this violent suspect before he could hurt anyone. The suspect was injured during the application of a citizen's arrest. And as the eyewitnesses reported, they didn't believe that Mr. Neely was at any risk of death or serious physical injury from the restraints. Now, those are the facts of what happened, but I want you to listen to what the governor of New York said about the event and listen to her words carefully and see if she's describing the events of what happened on that train that day accurately. I want to acknowledge how horrific it was to view a video of Jordan Neely being killed uh, for being a passenger on our subway trains. And so our hearts go out to his families. I'm really pleased that the district attorney is looking into this matter. As I said, there had to be consequences. And so we'll see how this unfolds, but uh, his family deserves justice. Any questions? Governor, what would you say to passengers, riders on the subway, if they're in a position without cops on the car, uh, if somebody's acting erratically, threatening people, what are they supposed to do in that moment? You know, I think it's it's a case-by-case -case situation. This was an unarmed individual who had been on the subway many times, known by many of the regular travelers. And, you know, sometimes people have an episode where they're you know, displaying their, you know, their feelings a very, in a loud, emotional way. But it became very clear that, you know, he was not going to cause harm to these other people. And according to a witness, the man began shouting, quote, I want food. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm ready to go back to jail, and I'll hurt anyone on this train. The man got on the subway car and began to say a somewhat aggressive speech, saying that he was hungry, he was thirsty, and he didn't care about anything. He didn't care about going to jail, that he didn't care that he gets a big life sentence, and it doesn't matter if he died. 
Vasquez says he was scared and believes others on the train were too. It became very clear that, you know, he was not going to cause harm to these other people. And the, the video of three individuals holding him down until the last breath was snuffed out of him, I would say was a very extreme response. So is the governor's description of what occurred correct? Was no one in fear that Mr. Neely would do any harm to them? Did everyone already know that this was the type of guy he was and these three gentlemen just overreacted to someone who was obviously harmless? That's what the governor's saying. And that's why people are protesting because the politicians see an opportunity and are lying to the public. So now it's up to you. Do you agree with the governor? that this was a murder because Mr. Neely was just some innocent bystander and that he was having a bad day and was attacked by random people on the subway? Or do you agree with the witnesses and evidence that says Mr. Neely was a violent individual threatening their personal safety and some of the passengers needed to step in to stop him from harming people while they called police? Right now, which side do you think is telling the truth and which side do you think is just for spin? Let me know in the comment section. My name is Nate the Lawyer, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.